So I'm going to read a little bit more from my manuscript. So, you know, sip your tea, snuggle up with your blankets. <laughs> Chapter 4. What about those who have hurt me? So here's a quote. Let us be practical and ask the question, how do we love our enemies? First, we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. Reverend Martin Luther King. Uh, I read that in his book, Strength to Love, which has uh, some quotes of his that are just gathered together into this gem of a little book. I'm not going to lie. It's really hard sometimes to feel love for someone who has hurt and or wronged us. That is why I find Reverend King's question so important. How do we love our enemies? Maybe you wouldn't call them an enemy. Maybe it's just a difficult person, a beloved who has wronged you, or a garden variety troublemaker. How do we get from resenting them to loving them? But even before that, we often have to ask the question, why should I? I'm right and they're wrong. I'm the injured party. They should apologize and make it right, but they won't. Or they do and you still don't feel satisfied. After all, I'm sorry doesn't undo all the damage. First, let me say <clears throat> what forgiveness isn't. It's not having selective amnesia. You don't have to forget what happened in order to forgive. What a relief. Second, you don't have to condone or even slightly agree with what they did. Absolutely not necessary. Remember, there's a huge difference <clears throat> between what someone did and who they are, their true essence. Pure essence aside for a moment, Let's be honest, everyone is quite capable of behaving well and behaving badly. Both, even you and I. Mahatma Gandhi fooled around with women other than his wife, and Hitler was kind to his niece. It helps me to remember those facts, both that the person who hurt me is capable of behaving well, and whose essential nature is pure, and I'm capable of behaving badly or being mistaken. I sometimes wonder how I would feel or behave if I were treated badly for years on end, in a U.S. prison, for example, in a concentration camp. As the years wore on, would I get more resentful, desperate, and crazy? Under the pressure of a crazy system, would I finally commit acts I would never previously have guessed that I would? Honestly, I don't know. If Reverend King was going to wait for all the prejudiced people to apologize and make it right for him and other black people, he'd have waited all his life and then some. Meanwhile, he'd be weighing down his own heart with resentment. He would be adding to his suffering, <coughs> and it wouldn't help anyone. It wouldn't hurt his oppressors. Because he found a way to lighten his heart of that heavy load, not only was he happier, the world is a better place because of the hard work he did inside. Remember the part of Tukusang Akrimpache's story in Book One when he was in prison and suffering more from his own resentment than from the actions of the guards. With the guidance of lamas and the benefits of his practice, he was able to turn his experience completely around. He actually enjoyed prison. But the first step was for him to decide to offload his resentment. Rinpoche didn't begin by practicing loving kindness, compassion, and forgiveness for the guards for their sake. He began by doing it for his own sake. Later, he came to practice it for their sake, which might or might not have improved things for them, but it certainly did for him. I love that Neen Karoli Baba quote, never throw anyone out of your heart. That includes people who have wronged you. As I thought about that little quote, which is actually a real challenge. I slowly came to appreciate how powerful it was. It challenged me to look into my own heart and see that where I held on to even a small bit of resentment, my heart shrank a little bit. It was a little bit darker and heavier. 
looking at that, I realized it was an ongoing feeling, way, way in the background. I came to understand the accuracy of the phrase, nursing a grudge. I didn't want to feed any of them anymore. When I've unearthed a slowly smoldering grudge, much to my horror, it turned out to be a forest fire waiting to happen. Luckily, I had practices I could apply to work it through and actually resolve it. My heart immediately felt settled, lighter, fuller, altogether. With each grudge that I let go of, or even lessened, my heart became more capable of love and more joyful. The world just a bit more beautiful, the colors more vivid. And that's just the effect on me. Can you imagine the effect on anyone in contact with me? As I've said before, thoughts and views are contagious. If someone cuts you off in traffic while giving you the one finger salute, do you feel all warm and fuzzy? On the other hand, without one finger extended, a woman told me of a young couple that was deeply in love, basking in each other's presence while waiting for their airplane. Everyone at the gate was sneaking peeks at them, their faces lit up with warm smiles. Let's extend that out a bit. Now those people might just treat each other a little better as they're feeling love themselves. Those people then are just a little more kind and loving and touch yet more people. Imagine if everyone did the practice. Yes, it can be a conscious practice of forgiveness and freed up their hearts, felt more connected to everyone. And what about the opposite? Tribes are trying to wipe each other out in retribution for what other tribes did to them. Some of these feuds have been going on for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Not so long ago, there was an eruption of the age-old feuding in the Foreman Balkan states. Again in his book, Strength to Love, Reverend King had this to say. Upheaval after upheaval has reminded us that modern man is traveling along a road called hate in a journey that will bring us to destruction and damnation. Far from being the pious injunction of a utopian dreamer, the command to love one's enemy is an absolute necessity for our survival. Love, even for enemies, is the key to the solution of the problems of our world. Jesus is not an impractical idealist. He is the practical realist. I think of uh, Reverend King as really a modern-day prophet. And I think he was speaking about these times as well. Although Reverend King wrote that sometime before he died in 1968, that paragraph is even more timely today. When I was in my 20s, my father thought I was charmingly naive about the world. He was a kind-hearted man and at the same time saw himself as a pragmatist. As you may remember from book one, he was also a consummate debater. Hoping to lure me into a position he could then undercut, he said, you think if everyone just loved each other, we'd solve all the world's problems. I thought of the brilliance of the human mind that figured out how to put a person on the moon not too long before that. I thought that if we loved each other, we would apply ourselves to solving problems like feeding everyone while preserving the environment. War would be unthinkable. My mind flashed through thoughts such as this. I looked him in the eye and simply replied, yes, I do. We looked at each other for a long moment of silence. The debate was over before it had begun. Back to you on the cushion. That's all very well, but how do we get from here to there? Forget managing to get the whole world to love each other. How do I get myself to love everybody when I still have gripes with my parents or my power crazed boss? I genuinely believe that we start changing the world by changing our own hearts. Practicing the four boundless qualities regularly has changed the hearts of many people, including thousands of people in various scientific studies. I've used them to change my own. I see it as a great place to start on the world. Reverend King was aware that indulging righteous wrath can be a huge obstacle to stepping these four boundless qualities to include all beings. If we include from our hearts George, who was my friend who turned on me, or mom who mostly ignored me, not my own mom, 
by the way. We aren't including all beings. If we try to practice this finishing up with, and all beings except George, how does that feel? As I said above, when I do it, I can feel my heart remaining a bit shrunken and closed. Also, I can't help but focus on George sometimes. If I try to do the practices without thinking of George or whomever we feel hurt by, but I'm still secretly loading my heart down with resentment about George. My apologies to anyone named George. <laughs> so sorry. I, I, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to think of names that are sort of common but won't ever turn up in any workshops. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Yeah. <laughs> Practice forgiveness. <laughs> anyway, if I do that, I'm depriving myself of benefit of the practice. Meanwhile, need I mention that my resentment is, isn't causing any problems for George, I hope. Only for me. <laughs> So far, I've only mentioned grudges over actions that almost all of us would agree are wrong. Another category are actions that two people might not agree are wrong. I have no idea how many grudges are carried over simple disagreements, but I imagine quite a few. Another popular source of grudges happens when a person touches on one of our sore spots. Rather than looking to see if it might be our own sore spot that's the main source of our pain, we look outwardly and blame it on the person who happened to touch on it. Whatever the original cause of hurt, grudges can lead to actions that are just plain wrong in anybody's eyes. Well, that's some food for thought. So I'd like you to reflect, uh, now that you've just heard this, it's probably reminded you of a grudge that you have. <laughs> 